Evening everybody, great to be able to gather together around the Word of God this evening and our Moravian Daily Text in the New Testament. Um, at present, um, we're uh, journeying uh, through Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And we've mentioned some of the background already over recent days. Um, just to say, um, I know some of us um, were really good uh, at reading. At re I don't mean that. I mean, we really enjoy reading. That's what I mean. Um, and, and find that very, very uh, natural, even relaxing. Um, some of us were perhaps um, learners in different ways. And um, for these Moravian Daily Texts, I wonder, have you considered listening um, to the scriptures as part of your practice? I don't mean listening to me. Um, what I mean is just listening to the Bible. Reading is an essential part of our discipline. Um, but how about listening to it as well? If you've got a Bible app like uh, the YouVersion app or or an app specific to, to one of the Bible versions, then doubtless within it you will be able to, to simply listen to the audio version. Um, many of them um, are not in British accents, um, but they're pretty good nonetheless. Um, and some sometimes you can find them in British accents. Now, one thing that I would heartily recommend, although you may listen to it and think, goodness, that's not for me, is the Streetlights um, app or, or the Streetlights. You can find it via various um, music players like Spotify or similar. And what they've done is um, they've got people who are they're largely spoken word or hip hop artists and they read the scriptures. Um, in rhythmic and poetic fashion over the top of musical accompaniment. Um, it's largely from the hip-hop tradition. I just want to put that out there, although not perhaps the caricatures that you're expecting. Anyhow, I find it just utterly refreshing and illuminating. I was um, going to do the, the, the food shop this morning, um, and, uh, and there I was listening to the Paul's letter to the Galatians via the Streetlights app. Stunning. Um, it really just opens up the scripture in new ways. So however you choose to, whether it's in an ordinary fashion or in the infinitely superior streetlights fashion, um, have a listen to the scriptures as well. Um, it'll do you really, really a lot of good. Um, so um, anyhow, uh, I'll digress no more. Um, we are today in Galatians chapter 3. And our reading is from verse uh, 6 through to 18. It's a decently substantial reading and it's quite densely packed with lots and lots of stuff going on. Uh, let's just take a broad overview before perhaps we zero in on something in particular. Um, you'll be aware that Paul is basically helping the Galatians and, and doing so in, in the kind of the blunt fatherly way that he has to reject false gospels. And, and very particularly, and this was very common in these early churches within um, the, the world as it was then, um, you've got factions that we could probably term as Judaizers, and what they're seeking to do is say that you can believe in Jesus and in his gospel and have faith in him, but you also need to add in uh, practices of, of, of the Jewish traditions, of the Jewish law in particular. Um, I'm sure by now you understand that that is entirely contrary not only to the teaching of, of the New Testament that we've got so far, but to the Spirit of Christ. Um, our faith is in Christ alone. He alone is sufficient for our salvation. Now, here, um, and in my ESV version, this, this passage is entitled, By Faith or by Works of the Law. That's what's being described and, um, and and from verse 6 onwards, um, what Paul is doing here, and it's helpful just to get the structure, is he's going to give three examples, reasons, or ways of looking at it so that we can understand that we are saved by faith in Jesus and not by adding in any uh, law-based um, practice. The righteous shall live by faith. That's going to be quoted from, from Habakkuk here. What are the three examples? Well, firstly... Paul makes reference to Abraham. That's really quite significant, um, particularly if, if you know the folks who are contending against him were of the Jewish persuasion as well, because um, Abraham is the father of the faith. However, Abraham, obviously being the, the first one that, that God chose to be the father of this um, faith, 
I mean, he wasn't a, a Jew per se initially, or an Israelite, we might say. No, he was from a, a pagan background, an alternate tradition, and yet God called him and chose him and formed a relationship with him, a covenant relationship. And as Abraham journeyed with God, um, he was a man of faith. Um, verse 6 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, very plainly making the case that prior to the law, Abraham, who was not of any kind of pre-existing kind of cultural, religious or legal standing before God, was brought into relationship with God. God formed covenant with him and he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's not the law that saves, it's the faith that saves. Um, the, the second example that Paul uses is, um, is, is the distinction uh, between uh, law and uh, law leading to righteousness and faith uh, righteousness now he's going to quote here um, a few things here from Leviticus from Deuteronomy and, and Habakkuk specifically uh, which we've mentioned where it, in verse 11 it says the righteous shall live by faith now it is interesting Paul he uses here Leviticus 18:5. Um, there's two ways of reading this. One is that um, as, as Paul um, quotes here, uh, the one who does them law shall live by them. There's two ways of reading it. Either the, either the sense is that to adhere to the laws of God does allow the person to flourish. Now, that's quite a, legit, a legitimate way of looking at the law. Um, because, well, the evidence is very plain that those who adhere to God, the creator, his plan for his creation, most notably humanity, you and me, if we follow the, the, the creator's instructions, then we operate well, we, we flourish. So that is a legitimate way of reading it. You know, if you uh, do the law, you enjoy life because of that. There's another way of reading it. And that is to say that should a person be able to wholly and completely satisfy the demands of the law, then they would enjoy righteousness, that is right standing before God, which is the means of life, life eternally in fact. And that is a legitimate way of, of reading it. We know that the, the law is given to show us the way we ought to live. Um, but nobody can actually fulfill it. You know, we know, as Paul has taught us when he was writing to the Romans, we've all sinned and fall short of his glory. Um, there's no one who's righteous, not even one. None of us can keep the standard of the law. Um, so, in fact, law, even though the promise is there that we we could know life through it, and, and there's some essences of that some experience of that yet we can't possibly fulfill it in its totality so we are not actually recipients of the blessings of the law for ultimately rather we're under a curse because of our inadequacy and our inability to wholly and completely fulfill the law so the first example is of abraham you know pre-exists the law he's not of the the Jewish faith because he's the father of the faith and yet by faith he has righteousness counted to him the second example is is of the law itself and how it is because we can't possibly fulfill it it brings a curse and yet by faith we live um, now that example is brought uh, to its uh, logical conclusion in Christ and again, quoting the, the scriptures, cursed is he who hangs upon a tree. Um, we're, we're led to, to look to Christ. And all of the curse of the law is then laid upon him. So that we, by having faith in Christ, just as Abraham had faith in God, we, by having faith in Christ, might have the blessings of Abraham. You know, Abraham wasn't a Jew. And yet by faith in God, he experienced righteousness and became the father of the Jewish nation. We, you know, if, if you're not a Jew, 
we also can have faith in God through Christ. And we um, might also have the blessing of Abraham, as verse 14 says. It might come to the Gentiles, that is to the non-Jews. We can receive the promised spirit through faith. So that's the second example that's given. And the third example um, is given is from uh, human law, that in that um, a covenant, a promise relationship or a will, it cannot be changed. If you think about a will in particular, because Paul is going to talk about offspring, promises made to Abraham and to his offspring. Um, now they were there, again, these promises pre-existed the law um, and they were given um, to Abraham and to his offspring. Ultimately, Paul makes the case in verse 16, and to your offspring, who is Christ. In verse 17, he says that um, the law, which came 430 years afterward, now here he's probably utilizing the um, the, the Hebrew, uh, sorry, the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament text to think about the, um, the time in Egypt. Um, and then saying that the law came all of those years, 430 years afterward, but it didn't change the covenant promise that was initially made to Abraham. Verse 18, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. Hmm. Well, that can't be the case. Does God change his mind? Does God say, oh, well, I said that there, but now I brought in the law, so we'll just you know, pretend that didn't happen. No, God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So once again, we understand that our faith in God and in his promises and in the, the opportunity of welcome um, into relationship with God through Christ, who is the offspring of Abraham in the natural sense, means that we can receive righteousness. We can come into relationship with God. So I've got these three examples. Forgive me, it's a long-winded way of kind of going through it, but they're they are quite detailed. The example of Abraham, the example of, of the, the ultimate curse of the law as opposed to the ultimate blessing of faith in Christ. And then lastly, this this a, a dichotomy between the, the promise and the law and how these things are fulfilled in Christ. Three ways that we can understand that as Christians, followers of Jesus, we don't have right standing before God because of our adherence to the law. Not at all. Rather, we have right standing before God because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let's zero in on something before we come to pray. Um, in that last example, uh, Paul says, to give a human example, brothers and sisters, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Even with a man-made covenant, a man-made promise. Now, Paul says that really kind of matter of fact, doesn't it? Truth be told, a lot of people do try and uh, alter <laughs> contracts, covenants, break promises, marriage vows, uh, whatever it might be. And um, and the law and the, the courts exist really to... Um, to, to try and trammel the, the worst excesses of human behaviour. But un ultimately we understand that it's not how it should be. Promise ought to be kept. Covenant ought to form the basis for good and healthy relationship. How much more so with God? I mean, the three examples that we had, ultimately they depend not upon um, legal text or framework, but upon covenant which is a relational framework. Uh, scripturally, in the, in the Bible, a covenant, a promised relationship, it depends upon one who is, is the stronger or the senior partner within the relationship. And everything really depends upon them. They're the one who forms the covenant relationship. And then the weaker or the recipient party um, is invited into that promised relationship with the responsibilities attendant upon that relationship. With Abraham, who is a very wealthy and powerful, significant man, but the covenant was made by God toward him. It wasn't at all possible for Abraham to say, hey God, who I don't know and have never come across before, um, I'm going to make a promised relationship with you and I expect you to hold up your end of the bargain. It's not how it goes. God made the promise with Abraham. And the second example, when we're told that the righteous shall live by their faith, 
the, the, the actual nature of Christian faith is that God grants us faith that we then can place in his son Jesus Christ. The formation of this covenant relationship is dependent upon God, the, the mighty and gracious and superior partner. Even in that last example, um, when it is talking about the promise God made to Abraham and his offspring to come, you know, we often think that humanity is kind of improving itself, that we, we like the idea of being progressive, but it doesn't matter how many generations that should follow Abraham, there will never come a generation that will be so powerful or great that we have equal standing with God. No, we're dependent upon him for what he grants to us as inheritance. If God's made this promise with you, the superior, the strong, the ultimate, the, the unchanging partner in this God has made the promise with you. I want us to ask ourselves, how are we doing at keeping our end of it? Have we placed our faith in God? Have we responded to his offer of a promised relationship by saying, yeah, I'll promise to be faithful to you in return. I'll promise my life into your hands. I'll surrender and submit myself to your lordship and leading. How are we doing with that? And just as Paul said, in a human legal contract or covenant, you don't change the rules after it's been made. You can't annul it. How about us? How do we do it at sticking faithfully to the word of God's promise to us? When he offers us the fullness of life, if we present our lives and give them into his hands, how are we doing with that? Or are you constantly trying to snatch and remove parts of your life out of God's hands? Trying to wrest control over the decision making over this or that or the other. The righteous shall live by faith. If you've received right standing before God. If then you're longing, living, and working out your salvation with fear and trembling, living that righteousness forward, living that faith outward, then you'll keep the covenant. Actually, you'll be so devoted to the, the one who has made the promise to you that you'll you'll live according to its, its, its ways, its rules, its regulations. How are you doing? God keeps his promises. Do you? Come on, should we pray together? Lord God, we thank you for the way that the scripture really opens up these truths to us and stops us from thinking that we can meet your standards on our own. We can't. We fail. We fail utterly. We thank you, God, that the scripture over and over again makes plain to us that we need to throw ourselves upon your mercy. We need to receive the free gift of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And God, then we want to live that out. If you make this relationship with us, if you keep your promises to us, how about us? Not in our own strength, but because you've given us this right standing. You've changed us fundamentally. We don't want to go back to the ways of our sinful nature, of breaking our promise or, or, or living in open rebellion against you. We want to surrender ourselves in increasing measure. Help us in this, God. Grant us this spirit of surrender and of righteousness. Help us in these things, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. And good night. I hope that's helpful to you. And do please comment along. Um, it's really, really encouraging to, to others to see how the scriptures are landing with you. God bless you. Good night.